what would you change in your life? What if you could unleash the miraculous in your everyday life? Experience freedom, live in peace, change the world, become spirit contemporary. Join Leon Fontaine, world-renowned conference speaker, senior pastor of Canada's fastest growing church and CEO of Canada's only Christian TV station. Today on The Spirit Contemporary Life. All of our external behavior comes from beliefs. So you need to search out those beliefs. And if you can't find a belief or you don't know what to do, then just get into God's word and learn truth. Because truth will choke out wrong beliefs. When you get God's word in your heart, it pushes out the old. You literally begin to put off the old beliefs and thinking and you put on the new ones. In John 10.10, 10, it says that Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So why is there such a disconnect between this biblical promise and how most Christians live today? Why have so many believers become spiritually weak and ineffective at sharing Jesus' message of love? The Spirit Contemporary Life is the answer. It's being led by Holy Spirit, but in a contemporary way. It's being Jesus and demonstrating His love in ways people can understand and appreciate. Spirit Contemporary is unique for everyone. It never compromises the truth and it never makes others feel uncomfortable. It's freeing yourself from religious constraints and walking freely in God's amazing grace for His purpose. The Spirit Contemporary Life is absolutely crucial if the global church and her people are going to change the world. And now, from Calgary, Canada, Pastor Leon Fontaine. Hey everybody, it is so good to have you with me today. Today I want to just start talking to you again. We've been talking about the spirit of faith and how it just seems like, you know, years ago there was a resurgence of teaching on faith and how that we each individually have to use our own faith how that faith is a very individual thing and, and it really impacted our lives and the lives of friends and family around us. But as I travel around the world, it's a topic that people have kind of sheared away from because they haven't figured it out or it wouldn't work for them, they think. And, and, and people don't even want to hear about, in some cases, faith. And so we last time we talked a little bit about, a lot about this spirit of faith and how that there's always going to be a push against your faith. There's always going to be things, thoughts attacking your mind to make you give up on faith because this spirit of faith must be maintained by renewing your mind, uh, by spending time in God's word. And we live in a world so focused on movies and social media and things that really have no eternal value. Use them for fun and for pleasure a little bit of your day, but then where's your time with God and your time in the word? And it scares me getting around a lot of the new generations who do love God, even pastors and leaders uh, who think marketing is more powerful than God's word. Hey, marketing's got its place, so does branding and all the rest, but you better not have more marketing than product. Uh, so this product, I mean, this person is Jesus on the inside of us and what he will do in our lives. So listen close today. I'm going to take you on a journey of a new way to think because many of us adhere to our ways of thinking from our past. And the Bible is so clear in Ephesians 4, put off that old way of thinking and put on new attitudes, new theories, new principles, and make sure that there are Jesus' ways of thinking, etc. In Isaiah 53.1, Isaiah says this, who would have believed what we heard or this message? And you kind of go, well, what message? Well, all of Isaiah 53 begins to talk about Jesus. It is a prophecy of him dying, rising again, dealing with sickness and sin and disease, the curse of the law. I mean, it is all, the whole chapter is a prophecy about how we can live in the victory of Jesus even when we aren't victorious, how that he qualifies us for righteousness. He qualifies us for every miracle. Every I mean, this chapter is what the Apostle Paul and so many pulled from uh, and many other places when they taught the New Testament. The New Testament is really a rewrite of all of the prophetic 
promises in the Old Testament and put into a beautiful order to explain what Jesus did. Because everything Jesus did when he walked the planet was recorded pretty much in the Old Testament. And so Isaiah is about to share the most amazing chapter. He's prophetically to say this, and he starts out with, who's going to believe this? And that's what I find when I travel and speak across denominations and countries and, and churches, is people go, okay, that's like a fairy tale gospel and life isn't that simple, it isn't that easy, it can't be that good. And it is, it is. The Isaiah, it, as he is prophesying this, he starts out with this verse. Who's gonna believe this? It was so powerful but simple that many of the Jews when Jesus first was there and the apostles were didn't believe. Now many did. When it comes over to the Gentiles, many Gentiles believed and many didn't. You see, once truth comes to you, you as an individual have to choose, do I believe this or do I not believe this? And the Bible's very clear. It says, and you shall know the truth. And the truth that you know, the word know there doesn't mean just, oh, I got a few more you know, bits of information. No, no, no. The truth that you make yours. You know, to know someone is to know them. And even in the Old Testament, to know someone is that is the intimate lovemaking between a man and his wife and a wife and her husband and to know them. And the Bible says that it's the truth that you know that'll set you free. If you want to walk in a spirit of faith, you want to rise up, you've got to choose. What am I going to listen to? Who am I going to believe? Isaiah says, who's going to believe this? Often when you sense truth, but you're struggling to believe, you have to choose to believe it. You have to choose. And if you don't choose to believe, then you know, you're, you're choosing to believe something else. And whose truth is that that you're believe, believing? If it's your own five senses, you're in trouble because the five senses only give us knowledge from the physical world, not the spiritual world, God's world out there. Uh, and so who are you going to believe? And I really want to challenge you. I was on a plane one time with a guy that, wonderful communicator, much older than me, and, and he had studied religion, all the religions, which I have too. And, and so we got in a conversation, and he listened to me share Jesus. And I shared the beauty and the goodness of Jesus, the plan. He looked at me, and here's what he said. I wished I had faith, but I don't have faith to believe that. I, he says, I admire and I am jealous of your faith and what you believe and how you can believe this. But he says, I don't have faith to believe that. I cannot believe that. And you know, I couldn't get anywhere with this guy. Now I pray that after I left that Holy Spirit, who I know does, goes to work on him. But after I started thinking and I began to recognize that when you hear truth, you have to choose to believe it. You have to choose. And then once you choose to believe truth, you've got to chase it, focus on it, stay on it. Uh, and because this truth is Jesus, this entire chapter of Isaiah 53, it goes on to say in verse 1, of it says, Who saw the Lord's power in this? And in brackets in the expanded version, it says, And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Anytime you see this phrase in the Bible, the arm of the Lord, it literally means the power and the ability of God. So when you hear about the arm of the Lord in the Old Testament, the power and the ability of God. His willingness to get his supernatural power onto the prophets and the kings and to Israel. In this New Testament, it also stands for Jesus. Jesus is the arm of the Lord. He's been revealed to you and I. And if you want to walk in this new covenant, you need a relationship with Jesus. One, through the word of God and then through your prayer life. Once you know the word and you continue to grow in the word, it really anchors this relationship with Jesus so you don't get off in weird tangents. Who is going to believe? Who is going to believe? I am. I've made up my mind. I've looked at all the other stuff out there. I've looked at religions. I've looked at Islam. I've looked at the things about Buddha and Confucius. And there are good principles in almost everything out there. That's why people want to get involved in it. But if I'm going to anchor my life, my eternity, me, my kids, my family, my future, and all that I've seen, it's I believe on Jesus. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And if I'm going to serve the Lord, it's not going to be some kind of half-baked way of we're going to try it. We're going to be all 
in. We're going to know his word. There's been such a passion on me uh, in my lifetime to know that, that one day I'm gone and I've got five kids and they've all married wonderful uh, spouses and they've got kids and I want to know that the directions they're following me as their pastor, they all go to our church and are involved in our church. And, and, and I want to know that, that I'm learning truth and that I can show them the principles of Jesus. But each of them have to choose who am I going to believe. Do I believe God will prosper me or am I going to go my own way, do my own thing because I can do it better myself? Is it God that heals or am I only going to go to doctors uh, and just leave God out of it? Now, I go to doctors, by the way, no problem. I enlist any other person from chiropractors to herbalists to, I have no problem with other wisdoms and I get their advice. I get, and I've taken drugs from the doctor on this and that. I have no problem working with that. But I first see Jesus as my healer. And if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me, it quickens my mortal body with his power, his strength, his great arm. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? You have to choose. Now, if you choose to believe something, there are consequences to that belief. If you choose to believe, well, I'm just not as smart as everybody else. That belief will cause you to never reach for much because you're just not that great of a person. You'll never reach for much of a spouse. You'll never reach for you know, a, a great kind of friends because everyone's better than you. I'm just, I'm just not as smart as everybody else. I'm just not as good. That belief affects everything you will attempt in life. So you got to clean that belief out. Beliefs cause our actions and our behaviors. So many people are working on their behaviors, working on their addictions, working on their anger, working on um, you know, their overweightness, working on all these things, and they're trying to change their external behavior, not realizing all of our external behavior comes from beliefs. So you need to search out those beliefs. And if you can't find a belief or you don't know what to do, then just get into God's word and learn truth. Because truth will choke out wrong beliefs. When you get God's word in your heart, it pushes out the old. You literally begin to put off the old beliefs and thinking and you put on the new ones. I know people with so many rotten, bad beliefs that when they came to church, you know, I mean, I got to go find all my bad beliefs. No, just find truth. And they begin to, for example, find out who they are in Christ. Beautiful, that God is in love with them. He cares about them. He's got a great plan for their life. And as they saw this identity in Christ, I'll tell you, I'll bet you a hundred wrong beliefs just exited as they embraced the truth of God's word and that belief. And now when someone tries to, you know, get that young lady to go to bed uh, with them, and, and she used to because she was just looking for an identity, looking to be loved, searching for significance. Now it's just a laugh. Are you kidding me? Why? Because this new belief is who she is, beautiful in the sight of God, and that she's got a great life. She's, she's someone's wife, not somebody's plaything or girlfriend. And, and, and this whole new belief rises up from God's word. What do you believe? Where do you go to for your beliefs? Most of us, it was our high school friends, college friends, you know, whatever beliefs they had. It's amazing how you get those beliefs from them. You know, well, you only live young once, so get up and sow your wild oats because once you get married, it's all downhill from there. Heard that one all the time uh, when I was a young man. And I decided, no. In fact, my life's going to get better and better and better. And the more kids I have, the more exciting we're going to do it. People say, well, travel now because you sure won't travel when you're married. That is such a lie. I don't accept that. And Sally and I and our kids, I've traveled more being married with kids than I ever did as a single guy. You see, what are you going to believe? And once you begin to believe the theories of your, your addicted friends or your party, your friends, or, you know, that's why when things are going wrong in your life, don't go talk. Someone said to me, well, I had a great talk with a guy who went through a divorce because I'm, I'm going through a divorce and we're thinking about divorce and he was so much help. I'm going, are you kidding me? Go find another man who's made a marriage work. And then talk with him before you pull the pin, talking to somebody who's had a divorce. Uh, yes, there can be wisdom from people who've gone through it on how to go through it. But listen, before you pull the, the pin on it and say, no, go talk to people with wisdom. Who do we look to for our beliefs? The Bible is a book on principles of what to believe about yourself, 
what to believe about God, what to believe about the devil. What do you believe about God? Some believe that God's a hard taskmaster, that God might not keep his word because he's quote unquote sovereign. It's a real teaching today that, you know, because God's sovereign, I know he promised to heal you, but he doesn't have to. I know he promised to bless your marriage, but he doesn't have to. That's baloney. The Bible says that his words will stand forever throughout eternity. Jesus said it, I believe it. His word can't lie. If it's written in the Bible, I'll believe it till I die. Though the mountains be removed, this old course coming through my head right now, and cast into the sea, God's word stands forever throughout eternity. When I find something that he says and promises in the word, I can put my life on it. I can bank my kid's life on it. I can bank on it. And so what are you looking for, for what to believe? What are you focused on? Where do you get your existing beliefs from? When Isaiah wrote this book, uh, the first chapter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he began to write about Jesus taking our sins, taking our sicknesses, taking the curse of the law, uh, giving us as a gift our righteousness. It's no longer our behavior, it's believing on him. And he gives us the power to change our behavior. As he began to, it was like, who's going to believe this report? I am. I choose to believe his report. Why? Because I've seen the rest out there. And there's nothing out there that I'll put first before Jesus. And I'm going to challenge you. You know, if you say you believe on Jesus, then you need to focus and renew your mind and get into his word and get to know him so that the life of Jesus begins to flow in your body, so that the peace and the joy of Jesus begins to flow in your mind, so that when it comes to sin and temptation to get into sin, to get into wrong pleasures, to get into, to get off the path God's prepared ahead of time. He's trying to tempt you in a lot of different ways. That It's not even a temptation. You're so convinced he's for your best. He's going to bring more happiness following him than anything the world could do. He's going to bring better romance and, and beauty and intimacy with you and your spouse than any single person out there and all their parting. You've got to be convinced. And as you look to God's word, you begin to have a, a complete trust that God is the best way to go. God is the only way to go. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 and on, it says, We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. As it goes on talking about his grace, I want you to focus on this one phrase in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 4. We having the same spirit of faith. He's talking about Jesus before this. What? We can have the same spirit of faith as Jesus? When he comes on the inside of us, his truth, his word, his presence, his faith. I mean, it's here. And this spirit of faith, it means an attitude of faith, a constant every second of every day. This attitude, if you want to call it a state of faith. You see, it's one thing, let's pick on the word excellence. It's one thing to shoot for excellence in something that you do. But excellence is a state in some people. There's, it's an attitude of excellence, a spirit of excellence, a state. A state is something you're continually in. But a goal is something you just shoot for once. So if I hire a staff for one of our organizations that we're running and uh, they set some goals to do it with excellence, I get concerned because I just don't want them because this goal they'll do it with excellence, that goal they might not because it's not important to them. But a person with an attitude of excellence, a spirit of excellence, they live in a state. They're cons it's like water, you know, H2O can be in a frozen state, in a steamed state state or in a liquid state. And so if you go up way up north, man, there's icebergs up way up there that have been in a state of frozen for like a century or two. What state are you in? In other words, what is your attitude? What is your spirit? What, what is the state that you're walking in? I've chosen to believe. Oh, it does not mean that I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that I got in the mornings to get up and get myself back to, into faith because my own brain and my, and, you know, and, and my feelings, and as you get older, you got to be careful what you eat and, and are you working out and staying healthy. A lot of stuff tries to get your attitude down and off. I've chosen a spirit of faith. I've decided I'm following Jesus 
each step of the way. And I only can do that with a spirit of faith, an attitude of faith, a state, a constant state that I live in of respond to everything by faith. So when, some, when I get bad news, my immediate answer is to always speak faith. If I have a loved one, that all of a sudden I hear has been sick or injured. The very first thing I do is I just declare, thank you, Father, for the protection power of Jesus upon my loved one. Thank you for the healing power of God. Thank you for the best doctors, the best technicians, the best of everything flows their way. I thank you that life and health flows in them in the name of Jesus Christ. And I stand in agreement with them for complete victory and health and healing and recovery in the name of Jesus. My instant response is one of faith. If I'm about to get into an accident and you can see some of you driving down these slippery roads and you know, you're driving too fast or you've gone through an amber light or you're, you know, and all of a sudden you realize I'm sliding into a situation. My first uh, instinct isn't, ah, I'm going to die. Like so many, my first instinct is in Jesus name and believing for his involvement in this thing. So that the arm of the Lord, Isaiah said, who's going to believe this report and the arm of the Lord and what he's going to, what is the ability of God that's available to me? I want to challenge you today, have a spirit of faith. And in every area, you have a spirit of faith about your marriage. Have a spirit of faith about your kids. Have a spirit of faith about your health. So many people allow sickness to become their identity. Oh, we all have to deal with sickness. I do too. Flus push at me, viruses push at me, diseases push at me, etc., etc. But we have to have this, this spirit of faith. Otherwise, you're going to just give into it. And people begin to identify with it. I'll talk to someone and say, hey, how's it going? And as he talks, he goes, yeah, yeah, I have cancer. I'm a cancer patient. Or yeah, um, I have, uh, I'm a diabetic and that's who I am. They identify with it. And they've tried a few attempts to believe God for something. But to really have a spirit of faith that every moment of every day says, I'm not accepting that. I reject that. Even while I'm getting my insulin shots and even while things are going on, no, I don't accept this. I'm the child of the king. And they begin to push off their old beliefs. And they are identity beliefs. And all of a sudden, you'll see someone. There's things I've believed God for and spoken with my mouth and prophesied I walk in this healing. And I've seen it three, four, five months later. But it didn't really matter because I wasn't working and exhausting me. It was just my natural answer. My answer is I walk in health, complete health all the time. Every organ, every cell, every body, every bone, everything about me. Growing old, I'm going to grow old in health. Moses was 120. His eyes hadn't dimmed or his natural forces abated. If you do it for Moses, you can do it for me. This spirit of faith. It's not just, I'm going to set a goal to deal with this. Cool. What about a state of faith? an attitude of faith? What about a thing of faith that is, this is my spirit that's always rising up in me. Come on. And even if I have failures and even if things that don't go the way I hoped and wanted to, I don't blame God. I know that he was pulling for me and I just pick myself up, brush myself off and say, let's keep going. God didn't fail me. I'll figure this out better. Or I, I mean, I've got to figure out something more about God's word or my heart or, or the future or uh, there's lots to learn, but I'm not going to sit here and go, why did this happen to me? And then I'll beat up myself or God did this to me. Why did God allow that? And it just gets your whole life. You lose the spirit of faith, that state of faith, that attitude of faith, this relationship with Jesus, this trust. You lose it when you start chasing all these little questions that the enemy just uses to get you out of a spirit of faith. All you singles, marry people with a spirit of faith. Or you're going to live an entire life with every area going down till it's gone. Why? Because they don't have a spirit of faith. You know, anything attacks their financial career, down they go. Anything attacks their health, down they'll go. Anything that attacks their marriage, their sex life, down you'll go. Why? Because a spirit of faith believes the best, believes God's promises, believes that Jesus come that I might have life and more abundantly, John 10.10. 10. This spirit of faith, Make sure you recognize this is the way you've been designed to live. God bless you. You know, reality is quite the word. You know, people often say, I'll be realistic, Leon, when I begin to talk about what God can do for me. Realistic is a word that comes from your mind and the way your mind looks at things. So your mind will always measure what is realistic and what's not. And then it accordingly, like it's not realistic that I can jump off a building and fly. And so my mind quickly helps me by saying, don't jump off that building. It's three stories high, go down the ladder. 
okay? That's why drugs has so many people. When I was a paramedic, people would bail off of all sorts of things, and we thought they were committing suicide. I know by talking to some of them that they just had no discernment. They had to have a reality check. No, you can't fly. One guy told me, I can fly. He said, well, no, you're all busted up. So reality. But yet, as a believer, when you're going through something and the doctors have said it's impossible, the you can say, I'm going to begin to believe God. I've done what I can. That, you know, that's unrealistic. It is. It's unrealistic to the reasoning mind. It's unrealistic to natural help. But the supernatural help is now yours. Father, I pray right now that they would begin to believe in you and that when life has no, no way of them winning or succeeding or beating what's going on, that they would look to you and that, Father, your reality is superior to ours. I pray you touch them right now in the middle of this situation. Amen. It's no accident that you watch today's show. You are special and you have a destiny to fulfill. Our media ministry reaches some of the darkest corners of the world and your support is what makes this possible week after week. You are vital. You can change a life. Act today.